If you enjoy true crime buzz, but need some more true crime in your life, then check out this other awesome podcast that we highly recommend. Hi everyone, I'm Shell Morgan. And I'm Lisa Magistrelli. And we're the hosts of Whose Crime Is It Anyway? We are two Canadian girls who cover true crime that happens in the true North. You may think Canada is a pleasant little country full of maple syrup, snowy weather, and people who say sorry all the time. But it's much more sinister than that. There's murder, serial killers, missing persons, mysterious deaths, bank robberies and heists, and we cover them all. Province to province, coast to coast, and all throughout history, there's crime being committed across Canada. We ask the questions you want to ask, we theorize on what really happened, and we try to find out the truth behind every single case. If you're like us, you'll always be wondering, whose crime is it anyway? Join us wherever you listen to podcasts. Bye! Toodles! Welcome back to True Crime Buzz. I'm your host, Brittany, and today with me is Amber. Amber, what are you drinking today? You did so good. (laughs) (laughs) Thanks. Thanks. Listen to you being a full podcast host. I love it. I was a little nervous. I'm drinking a strong drink of vodka mixed with strawberry lemonade, and it is so tasty. Mmm, that sounds tasty. Dare I ask what you're drinking? I'm drinking Diet Coke. Okay, last time that we did an episode, I drank that delicious mimosa and then was sick the whole Mm -hmm. night. So I was not going to do that again tonight. (laughs) Yeah, I didn't think you would, and I think that's smart, so no shame here. You definitely need to take at least a week off, if not a couple. (laughs) Yes, very true. Very true. But I have had a hell of a week especially a hell of a day so i have wine but i was like no i need something stronger (laughs) i don't blame you girl you have had quite the week yeah before we get started did you hear about the whole gamestop stock market thing that happened that's all matt's talked about i knew it i knew it that's it like matt's probably into this isn't it so funny though it is funny but i'm also like oh gosh if i have to it's on tiktok it's out of my husband's mouth it's in the (laughs) news and i'm like i don't understand stocks okay so i'm just like i don't either okay when people are talking about i have no idea do you still have an idea because i have a video that broke it down oh no if you have that video send it to me because i surely do not know it it right now okay so you know what i'm covering today yes i do and i'm so excited for it It's cult time. Cult time. So Heaven's Gate is one of those cults that anytime someone said it, I knew the bare minimum. In my head, I would picture the crazy eyes of old Marshall Applewhite speaking into the camera, into your soul. And then I would picture the people laying under the purple sheets with the Nike shoes. And that's all I really knew. The shoes. The shoes and the crazy person. Yep. That's about it for me, too. That alone, if someone, like, if you had never heard of Heaven's Gate and that's all I said about it, you would be like, what the hell? So I thought, you know what, let's deep dive into it because I want to know more. So maybe other people want to know more. And it just sounded like a crazy good old time. And I'm so glad I did because it is interesting to say the least. I cannot wait to hear all about it. All right. So Heaven's Gate, also known as the UFO cult or the bad haircut cult is how I think it should be known. (laughs) was actually a very small but widely known cult that started in the early 70s. It was led by not one, but two leaders, Marshall Applewhite and Bonnie Nettles, otherwise known as The Two, or T and Doe, which is what their followers like to call them, and I'll get into all that later. Okay, good, because that already doesn't make sense. While their beliefs seemed to evolve over time, they ultimately believed that God was actually an alien and that Jesus would return in a spaceship to take them home. Okay. In a nutshell, that is the simplified version of what they believed. 
And spoiler alert, just like Jonestown, this would also end in a tragic mass suicide. Mm. And while all this may sound extremely insane, because it kind of is, what's even crazier is that this cult is still technically around. What? Did you know that? No, I had no idea. So let's put on our tinfoil hats and jump right in. You want to go join? Honestly, let's be real. Let me say this right now. <laughs> it sounds crazy, but when you break it down to the core, this cult is literally Christianity, which I am. Right. With aliens. Okay. So between that and like, I love me a good pair of Nikes. I love friendship and all that. I would have joined this cult. <laughs> okay. This is this is the cult for Amber. This is the cult for me. <laughs> if I had to choose, this would have been the one that got me. Oh. Until the haircuts. That's where I draw the line. You're very particular about your hair. Okay. So that's another thing I wanted to say from the get-go is we will pick fun, but ultimately it's heartbreaking. Yes. All right, so before we get to the actual cult itself, let's take a little backstory into old Marshall Applewhite. Okay. So Marshall Herf Applewhite Jr. was born on May 17th, 1931 in Spur, Texas to parents Marshall Sr. and Louise Applewhite and had three siblings. His father was a Presbyterian minister, so he was raised in a very religious household. He would grow up and graduate high school, followed by attending Austin College, where he would graduate and earn a bachelor's degree in philosophy in 1952. He later enrolled at Union Presbyterian Seminary to study theology and actually planned to become a minister like his old man. Oh. Around this time, he even marries Anne Pierce, and later they had two children, Mark and Lane. Nice names. Sounds like a nice family. Early in his seminary studies, he decided to leave the school and pursue a career in music and became the music director of First Presbyterian Church in good old Gastonia, North Carolina, of all places. Okay, but I've got stories with Gastonia. Dude, I do too. Like, when it said Gastonia, I was like, of course. <laughs> of course it was. We once went to a funeral there of, like, a distant cousin, and we got lost. And mm -hmm. we spent, like, the whole day driving around Gastonia and missed the funeral. Oh, you missed the whole funeral? Yes! <laughs> That's pretty bad. It is pretty bad. It's like this little town that is, in my mind, a circle, and you just go in the mm -hmm. loop. Yeah. So yeah, I could see how you would get lost. I can't believe you missed the whole funeral, though. Yeah, it was pretty bad. So in 1954, he was drafted by the United States Army and ended up serving in Austria and New Mexico. He then left the military in 1956 and went right back to his true love, which is music he loves music you're a psychopath if you don't like music so he enrolled at the university of colorado where he earned a master's degree in music and focused on musical theater so rather than becoming a reverend or a pastor he decided he wanted to pursue that music career all right and from all accounts he seemed to be pretty good not amazing but you know he wasn't terrible it wasn't like he was trying to be something he wasn't okay so after this, Marshall went to New York City, where, bless his heart, he tried his best at a professional singing career. But when that didn't work out, he ended up getting a job teaching at the University of Alabama instead. Okay. However, a love affair would end up ruining his life. Oh my. Sometime in 1965, word got out that Marshall had developed a sexual relationship with a older male student. Okay scandalous i didn't see it going that direction i know so of course he was fired and sadly his wife divorced him and took custody of the children Aww. i know broke my heart and this is seriously what catapults him into let's find a new life you know which is sad if you think about it because maybe none of the rest of this would have ever happened if this were today's times because that wouldn't be a scandalous thing now so he grew up with a reverend Presbyterian father, like, his son was not going to be gay. So he basically pretended not to be gay. And then, you know, of course, things happen. And right. people were not here for that in the 60s. That wouldn't even be a deal now. Except for maybe the student and professor relationship. Student teacher, it. yeah. Right. So after all this, of course, he was heartbroken. He moves to Houston, Texas and tries to teach at the University of St. Thomas. He even served as chair of the music department, as well as choir director for a local Episcopal church. Okay. During his time in Texas, he was openly gay. 
but apparently also pursued a relationship with a young woman who supposedly left him and sent him into another deep depression, and he ultimately resigned from the University of St. Thomas, citing reasons as depression. That's sad. This guy, my heart just hurts for him. Me too. And then, in 1971, his father died, and this pushed him further into depression and reportedly a bunch of debt because he didn't have a well-paying job, he didn't have anyone he that could support him, and it just kind of spiraled from there. Hmm. But on one fateful day in 1972, Marshall would meet his future BFF and future co-leader of the Heaven's Gate cult, Bonnie Nettles. Okay. Now, how they met is up for debate. What we do know is that Bonnie was a nurse at a hospital, and they met there. Some say Bonnie was a nurse at a psychiatric hospital, and Marshall was a patient there, which mm -hmm. sounds accurate because he yeah. was having a nervous breakdown. But Marshall says he was visiting a friend at a hospital that she was working at. But either way, the two met and quickly became the bestest of friends. He later recalled that he felt like he had known her for a long time or that they had possibly met in a past life before. And his crazy met her crazy. They were like two crazy jigsaw pieces that just perfectly fit together. Like us. Yes, but like theirs is mental health. Ours is just good time crazy <laughs> she told him their meeting was literally written in the stars and that had been foretold to her by extraterrestrials and these extraterrestrials told him that he had a divine assignment oh and this is the part that i picture that part in Step Brothers where they're like did we just become best friends and he's like yep <laughs> yeah no i can see that i can totally envision that he also told her he had visions, including one where he was told that he was chosen for a role like that of Jesus. Oh my. But I want to back up just a little bit and give some background on Miss Bonnie Nettles. Please do. So Bonnie was a few years older than Marshall. She was born on August 29th, 1927 in Houston, Texas, and also raised in a very religious Baptist family. She grew up and became a registered nurse, met and married her husband, Joseph Nettles, and they had four children together. As an adult, she turned more towards astrology, theology, and the occult side of things. Okay. She believed in a higher power 1,000%, but she also believed in, like, the spiritual side right. of meditation and horoscopes, choosing your own future and your own path and everything aligning and, and all of that. Okay. She even conducted seances and even had a little circle group that came to her house every Wednesday. And like, that's so cool. I want it a is. little seance group that comes to my house on Wednesdays. <laughs> yeah. I'll see you next Wednesday. Yes. Actually, yes. can we do it on Tuesdays so I can say see you next Tuesday? <laughs> yes. She would also see fortune tellers. And one of them told her that she would meet a tall, mysterious man with fair skin and light hair. Enter Marshall Applewhite. So Marshall and Bonnie became BFFs and started spending so much time together that Marshall actually moved in with Bonnie and her family. Okay, so she was still married. Yes. Okay. Yes. All right, then. Now, although they decided to cohabitate, their relationship was not a sexual one. They both said that from the beginning. This was very deep and loving, but very platonic. Okay. So, like you said, she was married with kids. So this new close relationship with another man, regardless of what they said, wasn't very healthy for her marriage. And eventually her husband divorced her and she lost custody of her children too. Mm -hmm. Marshall also permanently broke off contact with his family as well. And he truly saw Bonnie as his soulmate. So in late 1972, they decided to leave everything behind and travel across the country to spread the word and teach others about their beliefs, beginning with the Southwest and Western United States. Okay. And while traveling, they would constantly read the King James Bible, especially the Book of Revelations, the coolest part of it. Oh, yeah. Along with lots of science fiction novels. So by June 1974, they had solidified their beliefs from Christianity and science fiction into a basic outline of what they believed. All right. So they concluded that they had been chosen to fulfill biblical prophecies and that they had been given higher level minds than other people. 
They believe that they were the two witnesses mentioned in the book of Revelation chapter 11 who were appointed by God but ultimately die after their work is done and then God resurrects them and they ascend to heaven in front of their enemies. So they thought we are those two. Oh, we okay. are the prophecy coming to life, which live your truth. But um, then they decide to put a big alien twist on it. <laughs> Let's sprinkle a little aliens in there. <laughs> I just imagine the guy with the salt, you know, like, oh, yes. some alien magic yes. in there. Okay. So that was the basis. They thought that they were those two witnesses in the book of Revelations, except they interpreted this all a little differently than most people. They believed that they would be killed and then restored to life and in the view of others, transported into a spaceship, not a cloud. Okay. Into space which was heaven. So in the Bible, every time you see an angel or you see God, it's always a bright light and on a cloud. Well, they think that bright light is like a star. And they think that God, if he really does come down from the heavens to do miracles, aliens come from the heavens and the heavens is actually space. Like it kind of makes sense to me. If you believe in aliens, it makes sense. Well, I mean, you know. And now I feel like that guy on ancient aliens with the crazy hair. <laughs> I mean, I get what you're saying because, like, <laughs> when you think about heaven, like, you know, as a kid, you think, oh, heaven's, like, it's up in the sky somewhere. So, like, space is yes, up in the sky in somewhere. in the clouds. Yeah, so, I mean, it's right. not, like, too far of it. It's a little crazy, but it's I can also see where they're at with it. Yes. So, when they were reading it, anytime it said the word cloud, like, he came down on a cloud, they thought cloud meant spaceship. But people didn't know what a spaceship was in the old days, so they called it a cloud. You know what I mean? So. Yeah. Okay. I'm like, mm, you may have a point there. <laughs> but either way. Guys, it's time that we have an intervention for Amber. <laughs> She's joined Heaven's Gate. <laughs> Look, I believe in Jesus and I believe in aliens. So when you got a cult that bring the two together and they're going to put some sweet Nikes on my feet. Why not? <laughs> so they decided this is what it's going to be. This is what's going to happen. And they decided to call it the demonstration. It was going to be a whole event. They wrote out a pamphlet that described all of this. And then they decided to occasionally visit churches or other spiritual groups and tell everyone about their identities, often referring to themselves as the two. But people thought they were crazy at first. I was going to ask, how was that received? Can you just imagine, like, chilling at church on sunday and people just popping up the doors like we are the two jesus is an alien we're going up in a spaceship like what would you do if somebody right? busted through your church well no 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 no. i think we've determined that you'd be like all right i'm on board and take off with the two i wouldn't take <laughs> off with them listen when we get into the the nitty-gritty of this cult and all the rules they had no okay no. but their beliefs, I can understand where they're coming from. Okay, so yeah, people weren't buying it. These two crazy loons going around to churches and other places talking about we are the two in the book of Revelations. And this is this, this part, it's sad, but it's funny. In August 1974, Marshall was arrested in Texas for failing to return a car that he had rented in Missouri. He just rented a car in Missouri and just took off and just never came back and never paid. <laughs> Oh, I guess he thought he was above heaven to pay for it. Dude, you got it. You got it. He spent six months in jail, even though he swore he had been, quote, divinely authorized to keep oh, the car. no. No, buddy. You weren't divinely authorized. And if you were, somebody forgot to let the rent-a-car place know. <laughs> yep. So while he was locked up, Marshall had nothing but time on his hands, and he used it to really refine his and Bonnie's beliefs. So they eventually concluded that they came from what they termed, quote, level above human. This was a physical and literal version of heaven, but in outer space, of course, and that they were sent to help others reach this next level. You will hear that through this whole story. They call it the next level. Okay. What they're referring to is heaven. To them, the human body was just a vehicle. You will hear that a lot. Almost like a skin that you're just borrowing for the okay. time being. 
and that to ascend from this world to the next, people had to separate from all that was human in themselves, including their earthly needs and desires. And, like I said, they believed that a UFO would soon take them back to the next level after completing their mission. Okay, but I feel like that's a huge thing with a lot of these cults. Like, you yes. have to, like, let go of your possessions and stuff. I, I feel mm -hmm. like that's a big part of any cult. So, that right it is. there, if you weren't already turned off by the talk of aliens and, you know, spaceships, that should have been your first sign. Like my favorite murder says... Call your dad. You're in a cult. <laughs> yes. Shout out to My Favorite Murder. So after Marshall was released from jail, he and Bonnie picked right back up where they left. They started publishing new ads and even held meetings with this new revelation that they came up with and actually started to recruit disciples this time. And okay. they called these disciples the crew. They had a name for everything. You could never call something like your body was not your body. It was your vehicle. Heaven was not heaven. It was the next level. Okay. So, you know, their disciples were not disciples. They weren't followers. They were the crew. And when they started this whole thing, Marshall and Bonnie actually established each other as equals. We are co-leaders. But later, Marshall would actually say that Bonnie was his elder because she was a couple years older than him. Oh. Even though the two did everything together and they were co-leaders, she was the brains and he was the mouth. Okay. She claimed to have communicated with these aliens about the next level, and then she would tell Marshall, this is what they've been telling me, and then Marshall would be the presenter and talk about it at these meetings. Okay. It's true, though, because if you watch, anytime they had meetings places, the two of them would sit at this table and they would take questions, and every time they would take questions, Marshall would almost always look over at Bonnie, and she would either nod or she would whisper something to him, and then he would answer. So, like, she was the brains, he was just the... Yeah, he was the face of the cult. For sure. Which is why you think of him Yeah. every time people talk about this cult. You never think of the little sweet older lady in the background who's actually running the show. I didn't even know there was an older lady until we started talking about this. So Right, right. So, here's where we get into more nicknames. They also started calling themselves Guinea and Pig. Oh my. And then they initially named their organization the Anonymous Sexaholics Celibate Church, and we will get into much more of that later. Okay, good, because I'm going to need an explanation on that. And then they changed it to the Human Individual Metamorphosis, or H-I-M, him for short. Okay. And they love to use the butterfly as a symbol. Marshall would bring that up at almost every meeting, that realizing your full potential and reaching the next level is like a caterpillar turning into a butterfly, into its true form. You're going to turn into your true alien form oh. when you reach the next level. All right, so the cult is finally starting to form. In early 1975, they attracted approximately 30 followers after a meeting in California. And then in later in 1975, that same year, they assembled another one of these meetings at a hotel in Waldport, Oregon, and they gained 20 more followers. But now they're starting to catch the media's attention. Oh. On the CBS Evening News, Walter Cronkite reported that the group had disappeared after selling all their worldly possessions and saying farewell to their loved ones. He said, quote, a score of persons have disappeared. It's a mystery whether they've been taken on a so-called trip to eternity or simply been taken. Well. They had friends, they had families, they were in college, and they just literally dropped everything and said bye and took off with this group. Okay. So people were freaking out at this point. They would tell all their recruits that their friends and family weren't true family. This is what caused them to break off from their friends and family. They would say, your true family are in the next level. Okay. It's almost like Scientology in a way. Right. You know, Scientology does that shit. Yeah, they do. But don't even get me started on them. But I felt like they were trying to attract people that probably didn't like their family to begin with. Or have, like, family issues. So most of these disciples that they were recruiting were young and interested in occultism or anything outside mainstream society. They were very smart, very well-educated came from a variety of religious backgrounds, everything from Baptist to Scientology even. Like, they were recruiting very smart individuals. You think of cults, you think people down on their luck and vulnerable, but actually these people that they were recruiting were highly educated people. I think that we all think that because of, like, the Manson family, because that's kind of what they yes. recruited. So, not necessarily true. Right. 
From this point, Bonnie and Marshall changed their nicknames yet again. They were no longer Guinea and Pig. They were Bo and Peep. Okay. Because they were leading sheep just like Jesus did. Oh, my gracious. And then later, they were no longer Bo and Peep. They were T and Doe from the song and the sound of music, which was one of Bonnie's favorite movies. Screw her. It's one of my favorite movies. It's a great movie. It's amazing. But she loved it. And so she took that and used it as their new nicknames. Oh, my gracious. So the two, T and Doe, and the crew then traveled to Colorado, then Oklahoma, and pretty much all over the country and continued to spread the word and recruit more followers. They would camp in tents and beg for food and money to get by. They literally were just road tripping it and like flying by the seat of their pants okay. to do what they had to do. But of course, the more followers you get, the more money you get. Especially right. those trust fund babies. You get one of those, you're gold. But the media continued to label them as basically a crazy UFO cult, which of course they didn't like. So around 1976, they decided to go underground stopped going to all these meetings and holding all these public forums and started being more exclusive. And they even started trimming down their followers from 200 to less than 50. So they started going through and picking out like who's truly here. If you're not, goodbye. Okay. They also started recording their teachings rather than doing it in a public forum. They recorded them and started calling them the classroom recordings and you can find them online. So their rules also started to evolve. They issued a list of 17 steps, which was almost like a questionnaire to know if you were worthy or not for the next level. And it had questions such as, can someone tell you to tell someone to do something and can you repeat the exact words back to them without putting your own flair on it? Or can you believe something that is told to you regardless of whether you truly believe it or not? Like it was core things that like get inside your head to know how committed are you. Basically, how brainwashed are you? That's what that is. Exactly. Are you willing to do whatever we tell you to is what it should have. One question. That's it. That's right. <laughs> you don't need 16 more. You were also assigned someone called a check partner. And this person would make sure that you were following the rules and would tattle on you if you didn't. Okay. Make sure everyone was behaving. There was also a very strict no sex, no human level relationship, no socializing period rule, not even masturbation, no friendly hugs, nothing, nothing, including impure thoughts. Wow. Well, I'm out of this cult at this point. Like that would have been mm -hmm. the point yep. they were like, there's the door. <laughs> and everything also became very uniform. They wanted everyone to look the same. So they all started wearing similar clothes, which was mainly button up long sleeve shirts, loose pants or slacks. Anyone who needed glasses, they all had to wear the same kind of glasses. And yes, similar haircuts, which they gave themselves. So we're talking put the bowl on the head, cut across the forehead, short men haircuts. Ugh. It was not a good look at all. No, not cute at all. They also decided to give their followers new names. What you would have to do is remove all the vowels from your first name and leave only three consonants. And then everyone's name ended in O-D-Y. O-D. So, like, my name would be a Brody. A-B-R-O-D-Y. You would be Brotody. Nope. Or, if you didn't like that, you could literally pick a word that you liked, like orange. And you could be Orange Jody. All right, then. Bonnie also liked to use the Borg from Star Trek, which I've never watched, so I don't know what that is. Any what? Trekkies out there? You've never seen Star Trek? No, I'm a Star Wars girl. Well, it's been a fun friendship. <laughs> Shut up. So do you know what the Borg is? Do you understand that? Yes, yes. Okay, good. Because when I was reading that, I was like, I don't know what she's referring, but I'm going to put it in here because the Trekkies out there will know. Little did you know you were going to be doing this episode with a Trekkie basically the borg is the analogy and so like on earth you would try to be as uniform as you could but once you reach the next level everyone would be genderless everyone would be uniform everyone would be in a synchronized form of thinking okay now this just sounds boring too like how boring this right? all sounds Ugh. no personality whatsoever None. no flair no personalization no you had to look like the person standing next to you regardless of their gender okay they were also asked to cleanse their bodies of the impure influence of things like fast food 
and impure sexual thoughts. They even used the master cleanse, which I know you've heard of because I've heard of it. It was something that was invented by Stanley Burroughs, I think is how you say his name. It was real popular in the 70s, but it's that mixture of lemonade, cayenne pepper, and maple oh, syrup. Yeah. Yep, yep, I've heard of that. You basically had to live off of that for three months to cleanse your body of everything. No. No food, no. nothing, just that. No McDonald's. I mean, this sounds like the worst cult ever. <laughs> right? <laughs> but these people, when you see them in interviews and video clips, they seem so happy. They're so happy. This is the happiest cult on the planet in the solar system. <laughs> That's because they're brainwashed. Mm -hmm. Nobody could brainwash me out of McDonald's and sex, though, so. <laughs> and so, like I said, they were traveling around and sleeping in tents and begging for money, but the more people they recruited that happened to have money, because some of these followers were children of CEOs and stuff, mm -hmm. so they moved up into a house, and then eventually they actually got their own mansion. Wow. And then eventually tragedy strikes. Bonnie develops eye cancer and ultimately had to have her right eye removed completely, but the cancer then spread to her liver and she ended up dying from that on June 19th, 1985. Oh, I feel like you're about to tell me that this like really messed up Marshall. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. We're going to get into that for sure. But that's where we will stop. We will pick back up on part two next week. So be on the lookout for that episode. Love our podcast? Then hit that subscribe button and leave us a review. We're also on Patreon. Head on over to patreon.com slash truecrimebuzz and join today for access to all our exclusive content, including bonus episodes. You can also find us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter at TC Buzz Podcast. And check out our website at www.truecrimebuzz.com. Until next time, cheers. cheers.